Welcome. I'm Jason. I'm Benjamin. And we would like to show you how you can use Embraco 9 as a headless CMS. We're with ProWorks, an Embraco Gold partner. And Benjamin is a newly minted MVP, I would just like to say. So yay. Yay. So why headless? Well, from our experience, uh, marketing communication teams want to easily manage their content across multiple channels, multiple websites, and multiple platforms. They want to be able to move fast, release new campaigns, new products, new sites. They want to be able to stay relevant and not have dated designs, as well as use the latest marketing and communications tools to meet their goals. And they also need excellent performance. Uh, that's becoming uh, a big deal in SEO going forward. Uh, internal IT wants a secure website. They want painless deployment, and they want the site to just be up. And we feel that Headless can contribute to these goals and uh, help make it easier for us to deliver on them. So our challenge uh, is, so we're a Umbraco Cloud powerhouse at ProWorks. We like Umbraco Cloud, and we definitely recommend it and Hardcore for Headless. However, we have clients uh, such as government and public clients who aren't able to leverage that infrastructure. They have very specific requirements around hosting. And also some US companies don't want to have their hosting in Europe, which is changing. There uh, will be regional options here in the US for Embraco Cloud, but currently that isn't an option. So with Embraco 9 coming up, uh, we wanted to, to uh, see if we could get a something we felt uh, was good using uh, GraphQL and as a headless CMS. And we wanted to make sure it felt like Embraco for us because our clients like the experience of Embraco. So when we're thinking about goals of this proof of concept, uh, we wanted to make sure the content editor experience was top notch. We wanted to make sure the development experience was top notch. We wanted to feel comfortable with the architecture that it was ready to go live and something we could pitch to our clients. And of course, it needed to be reasonably uh, cost effective. So here's our stack. Uh, we're using Embraco 9 beta 3. We are using uh, site search with examine beta 1. We are using the GraphQL community package for the API layer. Uh, we've been at ProWorks, we've been uh, helping contribute to that project over the last few months. And Benjamin's been working very hard to get an alpha out that works with Embraco 9 that was just released a week or two ago. For automated deployment, for both content and code, we're using GitHub Actions. Hosting is on Azure using Linux, and we're fans of VJS, so we're using Gridsome for our front-end templating piece. And we're gonna focus on examine GitHub Actions and Gridsome in this talk. To delve a little bit into kind of what Jason was talking about there with the Gridsome piece that may be something new to those in the Embraca community. It's um, similar to Next.js that was presented earlier. It is a static website builder. Um, it focuses on building an entire set of HTML pages, CSS, JavaScript for your site uh, at one point in time and publishing those files. So you can host them on any static hosting site. Um, in our framework here, you can see we've chosen to host those on static web apps. That's a relatively new technology in Azure. It allows for static content to be hosted, but also they provide some features like identity and authentication and some easy integration with Azure Functions. And so we felt that that was really the way to go. Gridsome provides the taking all the data, building it into a set of files, and then hosting that on the static web app with, as Jason said, the Embraco 9 instance being on Linux. We've covered a lot of this in our blog um, on a blog post last February, and we're going to continue updating that. We actually have a blog post out there now uh, that talks about our talk here and has links to all the code sources if you wanna review that. And we'll be updating that in the next few weeks with some step-by-step -step instructions for how to do a lot of what we're talking about today. Okay, so I'm going to do a quick demo of uh, the publishing workflow, but I'll start with quickly just 
going over what it what this looks like from the front end and the back end as well. So here we have a basic site. It's a proof of concept site. It's got a few pages, uh, pretty pretty basic examples of uh, content, but it does have a site search. So uh, if we type in a search term, it will return pages that contain that search term. Uh, that's using the new examine beta one. If we look at the back office, uh, it's just in Brocco. So there's pages underneath the home. There's uh, things we would expect to see. If a new page is added, then that will show up on the uh, front end of the website. We're using content blocks. We like uh, to use components when we're building out uh, our sites. And so I'll just quickly add some text to the About Us page to just sort of give something that we can publish to the live site, add a link. And <clears throat> so this will just demonstrate kind of what the, the publishing workflow would look like from the content editor's perspective. So in this case, we're just pressing save and publish as normal. And then that fires off the process that actually publishes that content out to the static web app. So that message there, uh, it is not actually available yet on the, the website. Uh, it does take a little bit more time. It's not immediate. So you can see here, if I refresh the About Us page, it's not there yet. So uh, it's sending off a, an event uh, that, that uh, goes out to GitHub Actions, which then builds the content and packages it up for the static web app. So here you can see it's still running. Uh, GitHub web action or github actions takes a couple minutes to push that live so definitely we would want to have some sort of notification here that it's being published and when it's finished uh give a, a notification back that says it was published to the to the editor to improve that experience in the past as well so preview is not an option here uh, unlike hardcore so it's because Umbraco is not rendering anything uh, grid is doing all the rendering so we would definitely recommend, and what we've done in the past, is that this actually publishes to a preview or a staging instance where uh, everybody can review the content and that can be approved through the normal approval workflow. Um, typically, we'd have a content app or a dashboard that would uh, help with that publishing process. Um, and part of the reason why I use this as a video so I could zoom ahead. So yay, we're done. Uh, so now if we go to the front end of the site and do a refresh after that GitHub action is done, we can see our content now and the site search will show that content in the site search as well. All right, so I'm going to hand it over to Benjamin. All right, so I'm going to cover here some of the grids, some config and templing. How do we get the data out of Embraco? How do we make that site in Gridsome? How does that build process happen? We're going to get into a lot of code here. We're going to get into a lot of uh, GraphQL queries, Vue.js templates. Um, it's going to get pretty dense, so take your caffeine hit, get me on your big screen, um, and let's dive in. First thing I want to drill down into is let's look at the Embraco project itself. This is a traditional Embraco 9 project. We don't have a lot going on here, but I can see that, for example, we've included the R Embraco GraphQL alpha package as part of our project. That in and of itself allows us to start using GraphQL with our project. That is all it takes. We don't have to enable or add anything additional. but in our setup, we do want to use, for example, the uh, playground. And so with some lines of configuration, we can enable our play playground. We can also add some cores headers to allow specific origins. When we get that, if we come and look then at Umbraco and dive in a little deeper here, you can see that in the back end, we've got three properties that we're using. So these three properties, title, content, and show in menu, you'll get to see later as we walk through some of the templating. But just know that those are regular properties in Umbraco. As you can see, it's a text string. As Jason mentioned, this is just a block editor with regular block components that themselves have a title content and a 
Boolean field on them. If we go and look at this in GraphQL, we can drill into and see that if you watch Pornima's video, you can see a lot of the same things here in the playground. Um, but we've got a querying and Brocco content. We want to get it by type, and we're going to search for the types that we know are the document types that have uh, page content. And when I get that, for example, I can see over here on the right side that this is my home page. It's using the home page template. It's at the root URL. It's got a title and we want it shown in my menu. We drill back down now into our application. We're going to see something similar here. So with Gridsum, as I mentioned, Gridsum is kind of a data aggregator. It's pulling data from various sources, and one of those sources can be Umbraco. Um, we're using the Umbraco, or we're using the Gridsum GraphQL plugin to go out to that Umbraco GraphQL URL and actually get data. In here, as it initializes Gridsum to actually start building things, we're going to do a GraphQL query that will go out and look very similar to the one that I just showed you in the playground. It's going to get all of the content pages that we want rendered as pages on the front end of our application. Now, the challenge we run into using Gridsum by default is that by default, Gridsum wants to have all the pages declared in our source tree. It wants the front end very declarative here by default, but it has the option to also dynamically add pages at URLs. Since we wanted our content editors to be able to maintain their data as well as the content structure in the Umbraco back office, we went with the option of giving them the dynamic pages. And so we're querying all the pages that they're going to create, and then we're calling this function that we've added, which comes and looks at the URL that's defined on the page. What URL does Umbraco say this node should be visible at? And what template does Umbraco say should be used to render that? So the content editor still can pick multiple templates in the back end and still can move their content around to different paths, and that will be reflected in the Gridsum build process. We take that node and we create a page here with a certain path using the given template component that we'll look at and then with all the data that we have for that node, all the properties and fields. So let's take a look at one of those templates. The home template, as you can see, doesn't have a lot in it. Um, all it's telling us here at the top is that we want to use the content page layout. Just like in CSHTML, this is kind of your master page. This is the layout page that defines how to render this. And since home doesn't have anything beyond what's in the content page, we just need to tell it that for the home template, we want it to be a content page layout. In the content page is where we read that block editor property, the context.content. And we execute this component that I've created here, which iterates over each block. And using components for each block, we render those out just like we might do with CSHTML partial views. The content page also includes a reference to the general layout. The default layout contains a lot of the things that you see wrapping around the page. So we've got the main content section, which has our content name. As we mentioned earlier, that's the header of the page. We've got our sidebar which has the search section Jason, Jason demonstrated. We've got our menu listing all the nodes that we wanted. And then we've got our footer with our copyright information. Beyond that, it's fairly generalized Vue.js templating. These all combine together, and we'll drill into some of this a little more, but all of these combine together then to take this structure that is defined in the Umbraco back office as a hierarchy of pages and actually combine that with the Vue.js view templates um, to render the static content that will then be published to the front end of our site.
Which brings us to our next topic, which is the content change notifications. As Jason mentioned, when he did a save and publish in the back office, he didn't have to do anything extra to go and tell the site to regenerate. That happened automatically. It was rebuilt using a GitHub action. Now, we set up that GitHub action, and you can check out the parameters for that in our code repository, but how do you actually trigger the GitHub action? How do you tell Embraco that when a content change happens, we want it to go and fire off that GitHub action? And the way we do that is using notifications. In prior versions of Embraco, we would, might have static event handlers that we would add event handlers to. In version nine, they got rid of the static events and instead have switched to notifications. So there's a content copied notification, a content published notification, rather than a on published or on publishing event on the content service. We can in here, as part of our composer, add notification handlers for each of those notifications we want to deal with. And we provide the class that is going to handle that notification. Additionally, I can set up some configuration options because I didn't want all of this hard coded. In here, I can set up what is the URL for the, my GitHub action that I want to go to? What is the authorization header and any body of the content? And if we jump quickly over to our Azure setup, we can see that those are defined then just as settings in Azure. We don't have to put those anywhere local. We can even have our authorization header in the Azure Key Vault so that it's secure and not there for people to look at in our code repository. But once a notification is fired, it triggers down to this class, which implements the iNotification handler for each of those notifications. And each of those handle methods simply call our rebuild website. Because we aren't really concerned as much in this case with what has changed, simply that something has changed. And as you look through here, you can see that all it really is doing is in the end, it's issuing a Git request or a post request based off of the URL and content that we've configured for application. That post request is what is then going to trigger GitHub to start the GitHub action that we have previously configured. The final area I wanna cover is let's talk about that examine search. You know, it's great that we've got a static website. We've got our content out there. We understand exactly what, you know, whether we're seeing and how it's getting built, but we also want to be able to make this site usable. Um, examine and searching is definitely a feature that any website really needs. So let's drill down into that a, a bit. Let's start back on the front end of our site. So when I come up here to the search pane and start typing, It does some magic in the background and gives me results. Now this is a static page, so where does it get these results from? These weren't predefined when the build happened. It wasn't all generated at that time, but it's actually going out back to our Umbraco instance and querying it. And it's doing that with a GraphQL query that happens from the client's machine. These queries are very similar. And you can see that we've got you know, great IntelliSense in here to help us, but it's gonna query instead of getting content, we wanna get examined data. And we can see we wanna get it from the external searcher. And we can either issue a query, which allows us to use the full raw, raw Lucene syntax. If you're familiar with the Lucene syntax, that gives you a lot of power and control. Or if we simply want to use the natural language searcher method that they added in V8, we can go ahead and do that. We then, after we've done our search or after we've said that we want to do a search, we have to provide what is the query that we're going to search on. And then finally, GraphQL is very declarative. It, it lets you say, what is it that I want to get back? Because there's a lot of data 
in the uh, there's a lot of data in the examine instance. You can see all these fields here that are stored in an examine that we have access to. I don't need all of these. In my case, because my Gridsome build has already generated and I know all my URLs and I know all my pages that are there, all I really need is the Embraco key. Now for this, let's demonstrate it's at a node name there so we can see what node it is. But you can see we're getting back then with the simple query, those same nodes. So that's great from the playground that shows us how we can use GraphQL to get at the data, but how does our application actually do that? To do that, let's head back to our website project. And let's start with the default page because that's where we have at the top here, our form, our search form. For those who aren't familiar with uh, Vue.js syntax, syntax, we've got a V model here, which is simply saying that this search text box bind its data in a two-way binding to this data field that we've defined down below. And then for our form, we aren't going to post this anywhere. In fact, on submit, we're going to prevent the default behavior and instead call our search method. So if we scroll down, we can see there's our search text field that we defined. And here's our search method. And this method simply gets our search page URL, wherever the search page is located at, combines that with the search text, and tells our Vue.js router to go to that page. Go to the URL with a Q argument and the search text. Now you may ask, okay, where does this search page URL come from? Well, again, we want this to feel natural to people who are familiar with Umbraco. And so instead of just telling it that the search page is at slash search, we actually have a site settings where we can use a regular Umbraco content picker to choose what is my search page that I want to be using for search results. That search page itself actually has the search template defined on it, telling it which template to use to render. So back here in my build, what I'm gonna do is actually use a feature of Gridsome called static query. The static query lets me at the time that it's building the static pages, run a GraphQL query against my data source that will have data that I can use on this page. So for my default template, I need to get content by type and I want the site settings. And from those, give me the search page property and the URL off of that search page. I can then use a computed value to get that static query, do some null handling as I go down, just in case one wasn't picked, and eventually end up with a node URL, the URL of my search page, which is then what gets passed back up to here. So that's how when I type search in the upper left, it gets me to the right page and it gets me there with the query string argument. Let's look now at what happens once I'm on that page, once I've gotten there. Well, it will render with the search template because that's what was defined in the back end. And in this template, we can see we've got a loading div at the top. We've got something that shows what happens if there's no results. And if there's results, we're just going to loop through them and put a link to each page, with the title of the page. Now, there's a one thing to look at here, which is as Priya mentioned in uh, Blazor as well, there's two events that we need to deal with. And to kind of demonstrate why that is, let's go back to the front end for a second. If I go back to the home page and I start typing code garden as my search, when I go to this, it had to actually load the search page on the right here. The search page wasn't previously loaded. I was on the home page. And so it needed to bring that into context, mount it and get it ready for display. And then it can read the query string parameter and display the results. 
But if I'm already on the search page, and if I search for a different term, well then it already has the search page mounted. It's already displayed and in context. There's a different event that happens that says, okay, you're staying on the same page, but my URL or my query string parameters have changed. And so we need to handle both that mounted event and then the view routing before route update event. In either case, whether we're coming to the page for the first time or whether we're just executing a new query on the page, all we want is the query string queue parameter because that's what was set by our default template. We'll take that value and run this execute query method. And in here, you'll see something very similar to what we had in the playground before. We've got a query to our Umbraco GraphQL URL, and it's getting examined data from the external indexer, or rather the external searcher. We're using the natural language search, and we're just going to get back the Umbraco key. I'm doing that because down below I have a static query that says, what are all the pages on my site? And from that, I can get the ID of each page. I can get a map then of all my pages on my site based on ID. And then I just loop through the results that I got back from examine, looking at that Umbraco key field, and any matching page I add to my list of results. Now you may have noticed something different here, which is that there's this query variable. Again, Purnima covered this, so I'm not gonna go too much into it, but though what this allows me to do then is to instead of building a string with my text here and constructing it as a string, I can build a single query string and add this as a variable down below, which prevents any sort of injection attack that might happen as people try and type things into the text field that shouldn't be there. The end result then is that I have a results variable that's fully populated, and those results then get displayed to the user using Vue.js. This is kind of our base, and you know this is something we built to start off and to get this going. We hope that you guys use it. As we mentioned out on our blog, our links to all of the files that you guys can start with, but this doesn't have to be you know, the end result for you. We wanted it to be production ready, but if you have the option of using Umbraco Cloud or even better hardcore, do it. Swap out Azure for that. Um, if you're more comfortable with React, instead of using Gridsome, use the Next.js that was demoed earlier. If you can pull out Examine and Media, into the cloud sources using Algolia and Azure Blob Storage, well then you don't even need your Umbraco instance to be publicly accessible. You can increase security by hiding that completely. And lots of Cloud Forms tools. Um, Umbraco did release a beta version of the Umbraco Forms for V9, and I have started working on the GraphQL package for that, upgrading it to V9, but didn't have that ready in time for this demo. So that is us. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Benjamin Karleski. This is my contact information. If you want to get a hold of me, um, down there at the bottom, you can see that I've got my uh, Umbra Coach information. Definitely, we've got sessions coming up that you guys can attend. Yep, and I'm Jason. Thanks for uh, thanks, Benjamin, for presenting that. That was great. And you can get a hold of me here as well. And we are part of ProWorks. And we've been doing Umbraco a long time. And we just enjoy people helping people be happy with their Umbraco sites. We're interested in all flavors of cloud hosting, and we're also very interested in headless and what that can enable for our clients moving forward. Uh, feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions or need any help, or just want to share what you've done with uh, headless. Thank you, and see you in the Q&A.